His current role is Director of Real Estate Advisory in EY's Melbourne practice. Richard has a strong interest in how decisions around strategic planning influence the economy and drive feasibility. Please join me in welcoming Richard to the stage. Well, thank you, and um, I'm very concerned I haven't put my uh, business cards down for those bottles of wine, so I'll have to find uh, where we actually put them a bit later. So, look, today I'm going to talk about some of Melbourne's sort of key existing mixed-use precincts, um, and I'm also going to discuss what, what mixed-use development is, in, really is in a Melbourne context, because it's quite different to situations overseas. The, the mixed-use development concepts really only just starting to sort of emerge in reality in some of our locations in Melbourne. And I'm also going to conclude with a bit of a tour around Melbourne of the future opportunities and some of the challenges um, in delivering mixed-use development. So according to the Harvard School of Design, and look, I don't know anybody from the Harvard School of Design, but I'm sure they, they're very good at what they do, uh, mixed-use development is defined as three land uses in one building. And now if you think about that, that's, that's pretty rare in a Melbourne, in a Melbourne context. Um, you know, we, we do a whole range of different apartment and retail developments, but achieving three land uses in one building is pretty rare. So according to this definition, no single component takes up more than 60% of the overall space. And, you know, right now in the CBD, we've got a lot of residential development going up with pretty limited retail and office development or vice versa, still a lot of retail development going up with, uh, you know, small components of, of residential. But that, that sort of definition in a, in a context of, um, um, you know, Melbourne is, is not, not being achieved all that often. Um, combinations of residential hotels and office space are sort of what, what really this definition of, in, the, in the planning policy arena is trying to achieve. And it's a struggle to name many individual developments in the Melbourne CBD, um, South Bank or Docklands that have these, these three components. The vast majority of projects we are seeing are not probably genuinely mixed use. Um, they've got residential or office precincts, but varying degrees of you know, ground floor retail activation. Um, apartment development is contributing to a mixed use precinct in the Melbourne CBD. So rather than sort of an individual development, we are getting more and more with the apartments developments coming on the CBD. We're sort of developing this mixed use precinct, if you like, as opposed to an individual mixed use project. And, you know, it, it's interesting to sort of compare where the CBD is today compared to the 70s and 80s and 90s. You know, I remember uh, my father had a sort of a small business in Melbourne back in operating in the 1980s up in Ferry Street, which sometimes come in on a Saturday or a Sunday and there was just absolutely no activity in the CBD whatsoever. You could drive around the CBD and you really wouldn't be in any danger of running somebody over or, uh, you know, having to sort of uh, negotiate um, the footpath with any other pedestrian. So it really has changed and one of the key drivers has been apartment development in the CBD and I'll talk about that a bit more in the context of other um, sort of centres. And, you know, it's as strange as it sounds, if you sort of suggested a trip into the CBD in the 70s and 80s, people would have probably laughed at you and thought, well, what are we going there for? You know, it would be, you, you might come to the city to go to the football, you might go to a pub before or after in Richmond, but that was really about it. So we've got pretty, a pretty limited level of mixed-use individual development occurring, even in the CBD today, other than obviously in this location, a couple of other examples. So what does, sort of, what does the policy framework say? And if we sort of think of you know, what, what policy says about mixed-use development in Melbourne, is it actually helping achieve mixed-use development or is it sort of constraining it? So current planning policy recognises that we've become more time poor and we need services nearby. And that's really why the planners are trying to encourage us to have this mixed-use development. In the 60s and 70s and 80s, you know, we could all jump in a car and we could drive from the supermarket to a, um, you know, to our job, to uh, you know, to a place of recreation pretty easily. The traffic was, um, you know, wasn't an issue. But you know, as we today, we've got a major sort of issue with congestion, and planners recognise that, and that's why they're trying to get all these all these different elements of mixed use development in the one location. Now, you know, Melbourne's got a population of nearly five million people. We're forecast to get to you know, seven or I think up to eight million people by 2050. So this sort of 
encouragement of mixed use development and mixed use precincts is only going to, it's only going to continue. Um, to respond planning policy, uh, I suppose in the suburbs, the other thing that's going to occur is planning policy is going to try and squeeze development into activity centres. So we've got a lot of, you know, residential apartments that have been delivered on residential zone land over time, but the planners are going to try and sort of constrain that activity into your activity centres. And you've seen probably in the media debate around things like the neighbourhood residential zone, which um, has found its way into a lot of the suburbs we live in. Um, and in that zone, for example, you can only do a maximum of two townhouses um, on one block of land, and only if the block's of a certain size. So, um, you know, we've got, we discussed some examples around Burundar earlier where that's occurring, and there's been a lot of debate about that. But the, the policy direction there is to really try and push development into defined precincts. And what that means for mixed use development is you've got that, that greater retail spend that finds its way into these activity centres that have traditionally struggled over time. So increasingly apartments will need to be delivered in activity centres um, and mixed use development, however, you know, you're going, it's not going to be a perfect story. There will be some conflict. Um, as your apartments come on in these precincts, you're going to have, um, you know, a lot of these new residents complaining about noise. Um, the pub will go late at night, the nightclub or the bar will be banging out a few tunes on the Friday and Saturday night. And the whole reason why individuals might have moved into this activity centre in the first place to access, you know, entertainment and to go for a drink and uh, not have to drive home, there'll be that conflict over time as individuals, you know, have their first child or, or start a family. Oh, I fixed the wrong button. That's not smart of me. How do we get back? Play? There we go. I've worked it out. So, sort of in thinking about our current mixed-use nodes, um, you know, where are the current precincts? Where's the action actually happening? And some of the current examples, as I've discussed, um, we've got a few in Melbourne that, you know, have been delivered over time and probably are what you'd describe as genuine mixed-use development. So, uh, QV in Melbourne, um, you know, obviously a large supermarket, in fact, the largest Coles in Australia, an anchoring development at the, in sort of in the basement of that shopping centre, discount to department stores, a large volume of speciality retail and office development in that precinct as well. BHP was, you know, obviously the, um, had their headquarters there until uh, relatively recently. So that's sort of, you know, it's, I think it's around 10, 12 years old now, QV, but that's, you know, an example of a genuine mixed-use development in, in the CBD. Um, we've also got, obviously, Crown Casino, which, um, you know, hasn't got, obviously, the apartment development, but has hotels, um, and obviously entertainment facilities and a, and a large volume of retailing in that location. Um, Docklands is a bit different. It's broken up into sort of a whole host of sort of different precincts, but you can, you could argue it's operating as a mixed use precinct with the retail offering, the residential offering, and certainly um, a, gr a large volume of, uh, you know, office and, and, and employment relative to the residential um, development that's, uh, that exists there. So Docklands is actually, gets a lot of criticism, but in terms of, the job to resident ratio in providing local employment for residents, it certainly is ticking boxes as a, as a mixed use precinct where you've got that mix of, of residential and, uh, and, uh, and um, labour force there. Um, we've also got some of our traditional major shopping centres adjusting over time and it was interesting hearing about Chadston before, um, um, before I sort of started the discussion today. Um, you know, Chadston, obviously traditional retail centre, um, and, you know, I used to shop there with the family when, you know, years ago in the 80s when um, it obviously was completely dominated by retail. But Chadston now, to increase its catchment, to increase its competitiveness in the region, um, has got a hotel that's going up in that location and some office development. So any way any of these shopping centres can have different uses and attract people for more time um, and even things like, you know, government departments, I think we'll see those mix of uses develop uh, over time. So if we sort of look around um, central Melbourne, there's, there's a lot of sort of mixed-use precincts that are coming on as well. And there's a number of existing urban areas where um, we'll see this development changing over time. Each of the precincts around central Melbourne, and this is sort of out of the old version of Plan Melbourne, but you've got, obviously in part from Fisherman's Bend, you've got Arden McGauley and you've got Egate operating there as two of the really major precincts that aim to deliver mixed-use development and a whole host of components over, over time. Um, 
Arden Macaulay is sort of effectively split into two stages, but the existing state government's got, um, you know, has made a lot of positive noises about moving Arden Macaulay forward as a development precinct. The first stage is sort of scheduled to uh, go through a planning process and be rezoned relatively quickly. Um, and then there's a stage two in Arden Macaulay post 2025. And that's, that's sort of designed to be in line with the new Arden station as part of the Melbourne Rail Link that will come on around that time. But Arden Macaulay is probably going to be a very attractive area because Fisherman's Bend's going through a bit of a debate and the current government's probably, you know, um, going through a bit of a process with Fisherman's Bend that'll take time to be resolved. Egates as well facing a few challenges. Um, the Western Distributor Project will probably cut somewhat through that Egate um, site. Um, and there'll have to be some thinking around what that actually means for Egate as that's, as that's delivered as a major project. Just quickly on, in relation to Fisherman's Bend too, um, the, you know, one of the main issues that all need to be resolved in terms of Fisherman's Bend is the extension of a, a tram service from the CBD into Fisherman's Bend. So until that public transport link is resolved, the previous government proposed having a Melbourne rail link um, you know, via Fisherman's Bend. But until that transport link can be resolved, you really the only primary demand for Fisherman's Bend is probably going to be for you know residential apartment style development. So it's important that that you know that that transport link is actually resolved in Fisherman's Bend. If we look at sort of Main Street retail and some of the current examples too, we're actually seeing some really good um, outcomes actually occurring in the suburbs and. The little sort of map over there on the right has just recently been released by the Department of Planning in one of their research reports and it actually shows the, the sort of the incredible sort of links between apartment development along the tram network and it's been quite sort of a long-standing policy of the state government to have that apartment development along the tram network and we're seeing that sort of resulting in significant activity there now. Um, some of the main sort of precincts that are sort of going through that change and working pretty well include um, Smith Street Collingwood. Um, and a mate of mine's just actually bought an apartment in that Coles development there, um, just above Smith Street, Collingwood. But that's Smith Street, you know, 10 years ago, even as recently as six or seven years ago, the retailers were really struggling in that location. Um, a lot of competition from CBD retail. But now, as those, every, every time, uh, you know, a state agent's saying, as one of those apartment developments get, um, reach com reaches completion, the new residents move in, you know, there's really good leasing activity in the retail sector that's coming on in that location. If you compare that to sort of Fitzroy Street in St Kilda, the planning framework for apartments there has been a bit more constrained. There's mandatory height limits. There's not as much activity occurring, particularly down the beach end of Fitzroy Street. So that street has really sort of struggled in terms of its, its retail sector there. A lot of large bars and restaurants where, where the catchment and the, uh, you know, the, the buying power of residences has shifted to other locations. So, you know, each of these primary traditional Main Street activity centres are going through uh, different phases, but one of the key drivers really is the, the level of apartment development that drives, um, you know, the retail sector, produces the bars and cafes, and then of course the buyers uh, and the young residents come in and want to move in that area and live in that location to make a, a mixed use precinct effectively work. So if we thought, sort of think about some of the future mixed use nodes and really across Melbourne there's sort of there's three or four different categories. So we've got um, defined in you know, Plan Melbourne which the state government released a couple of years ago, we've got these national employment clusters um, which have been released and the idea behind them is to try and uh, provide a spectrum of employment outside of the CBD. We've also got um, a lot of brownfield sites if you like that have been defined around the rail network. So those, um, they're designed to actually take advantage of public transport. And then we've got a, a range of future mixed use nodes in the growth areas. So if we just touch on those, the, probably the key one that the Metro Planning Authority is doing a lot of work on at the moment is uh, what they call a Monash National Employment Cluster. Um, and this is, a, this is sort of a location that um, really has a lot of competitive strengths. It's been operating as a light industrial precinct for quite some time. There's been a lot of campus style office development there more, more recently, you know, you've got Australand or Fraser's Properties head office there, you've got BMW Australia, so a whole host of sort of, um, you know, head offices and administrative centres for national and some international companies operating in this precinct. Um, the precinct accommodates, um, you know, a range of different employment assets and we're seeing that growth continuing. Um, but we've also got Monash University in the, in the precinct there and of course, 
um, you've got the, uh, the Clayton campus of, um, of uh, the Monash Medical Centre. So this is really an area that um, you know, the state's going to focus on um, over time. And it's got sort of, I think, a, a great sort of opportunity providing um, you know, additional sort of employment growth, but also there will likely be some precincts in here where you have residential development, and logically there will also be retail development delivered in this precinct over time. It's not directly connected to public transport as in the rail network at the moment, um, but of course there is the proposed uh, Roeville, Roeville rail link that, um, that would you know, run along um, Huntingdale Road and connect, um, connect this precinct to uh, the Dandenong rail line. One of the other sort of primary ones the state government's focusing on, and this is actually state-owned land that's been sold off and is going through a, through a process at the moment, is uh, East Werribee. Now, this is very different to Monash. It's 20 k's from the CBD, um, you know, apartment development and, and um, you know, retail development, of, certainly of a mixed-use nature, is probably going to take some time to mature and deliver in this location. But it's absolutely critical for this precinct to, you know, play a role in providing employment in Wyndham. You've got a population through Wyndham and Geelong of, you know, probably close to about 500,000 people ultimately that will be delivered. And without employment, you're just going to have this appalling situation of traffic, you know, on the freeway coming into Melbourne. So it's going to get, this is one of the sort of the state's, I suppose, solutions to try and provide jobs um, and retailing in a, in a precinct that is experiencing, you know, absolutely rapid um, population growth. You know, we've heard stories in Snades Road and some of the key sort of um, links onto the freeway of people taking half an hour just to get on the M1, let alone the time it takes them to actually get into the city. So this is a key, key precinct that um, will play a role in sort of changing the, uh, I suppose, the course of um, development through Wyndham. But given that, you know, through this area you can buy a house and land package for two fifty, three hundred, three fifty thousand dollars dollars $350,000, um, the apartment market is going to take quite some time to mature um, in this location. If we sort of look at um, future transit oriented to development sort of in our growth areas and how that's going to work, um, you know, we, we'll sort of think about Greenfields locations as well and, uh, you know, whether they've got any prospect of working. So. Apart from East Werribee, there's a host of greenfield locations, some of which we probably haven't heard of yet, and um, you know that's because they're, they're 20, 30 years away. So you know names like Lockerbie, um, Tarnie, Tulloon, uh, Clyde, these are all proposed centres that the Metro Planning Authority is going through a process on. Um, they're centres that you know, in their own right, all aim to achieve significant employment growth and significant retail development and ultimately we'll have apartments and uh, medium and high density development in these activity centres as well. But, you know, they've, they're at precinct structure planning phase, um, but, but they will be major, major providers of employment in the future. Um, the Main Street retail component and, and how that's going to work is actually designed in a lot of these centres, um, but, you know, some sort of commentators are sort of suggesting it's a bit of a pipe dream in terms of actually getting the bars and the restaurants and the cafes going um, in these precincts. So, look, one of the first examples quickly is the Tarnate Major Town Centre. I think that's got a sort of a reasonable prospect for success because it's sitting right on the regional rail link. So once this centre gets going, I mean, the regional rail link's are obviously already operating, you'll have 30 minute access into the CBD um, and you'll have sort of, uh, you know, a retail centre that's proposed to have around 60 to 70,000 square metres of retail floor space. So, you know, something similar to the Glen or Greensboro, one of these uh, shopping centres in the future. The, the, the precinct structure plan is designed to have Main Street retail and actually promote sort of, um, you know, a, a, an activity centre that, that a range of different people would want to actually live in, not just uh, first home buyers. If we look at Lockerbie to the north, so this is really sort of your, your big fish of the, of the northern uh, precincts. Um, this centre is designed to accommodate up to probably at least 100,000 square metres um, of retail floor space. Uh, for retail floor space. There's no existing train link there at the moment, but it does sit on the Melbourne-Sydney rail line, and PTV's got to you know, resolve how they'll actually provide a, a rail link into this centre. But you can see sort of on the precinct structure plan there, the little sort of red, uh, red notation of where the existing, uh, or, sorry, where the future train station will be. Um, and then you've got sort of that, that sort of light pink um, depicting where the, uh, the retail centre will be. 
So they will try and create sort of a main street mixed use precinct linking that train station to, um, to this major employment centre. It's near the outer metropolitan ring road. You know, they'll want to get government, government departments in there, um, probably, you know, federal and state government departments to sort of anchor, anchor this centre. But this is, you know, you're talking 30, 40 years away before um, this centre really starts to, uh, um, you know, compare to sort of a lot of our existing activity centres in, uh, in Melbourne suburbs. Just finally, I mentioned Brownfield's development along our rail network. So this is sort of the sleeper really in terms of development. Um, and just, just looking at the Dandenong corridor as an example, um, through Huntingdale and um, you know, down towards the Pakenham line, there's around 250 to 300 hectares of current um, industrial land where obviously um, res residential uses are not permissible. Um, but sort of hidden away in the back of Plan Melbourne and there's no sort of, sort of indication this is gonna change in the current refresh of the document is support for these precincts to adjust and change over time into um, you know, residential and retail precincts. So um, the Metropolitan Planning Authority is doing a fair bit of work, particularly in the Huntingdale precinct. Um, and this is where sort of a lot of your, um, I suppose, soaking up of future residential and apartment development will actually occur um, you know, as, as residents in these areas continue to complain about apartment development on residential zone land. Um, Brunswick and Coburg in the north is another example um, on the upfield line where you'll see a lot of your light industrial precincts trans transform over time. So traditionally a lot of the local councils in these areas have pushed back a bit. They've said, no, we want the industrial land, we want that local employment. But a lot of the factories and sites um, you know, here are becoming vacant over time. It's sitting on top of a rail system so that you know, planning 101 is effectively dictated that um, in the medium term, these precincts will become um, another source of mixed use development in the future. So really, you know, what's, what's the conclusion here? Mixed use development, the, the policy support is there and the plan has certainly wanted to happen. Um, we do have a large number of precincts that are being delivered in central Melbourne, um, you know, successfully as, as mixed use development. But, you know, the individual developments as individual sites delivering mixed use development in the uh, in the theoretical sense are still sort of uh, relatively rare. Um, but I think, you know, the cost of congestion and commuting over time is just going to continue to mean that, um, you know, the development sector is going to have no choice. Um, the, you know, mixed use development is going to really be the only choice we'll have in the future that will actually work. Thanks. Thank